Good morning. There we go. It's good to see you guys this morning. I got to close Facebook. I didn't know Facebook was open. There it is. Can we say hi to everybody? Some of you guys see on Facebook more than church, so that's good. But I mean, every day, so it's good. Good to see you. Today we're going to talk about showing mercy to your family. And um, somewhere in this message, you're going to do one of these. Oh. Because we're going to look at the, the 1 Corinthians 13 talking about love. And all of us, all of us at home struggle. And we struggle sometimes with family more than we ever struggle with strangers. We uh, are nice to strangers. They make a mistake and we forgive them. And with our own family, if we're not careful, we tend to be harsh. We tend to be short. We tend to say things we would never say to anybody else. And so we're going to look at this idea today and give you some tips because I know that some of you may have developed some bad habits. You may have grown up in a home full of bad habits about how you treat each other. So here's our starting verse. Psalms 101 verse 2 from the Living Bible says this. Lord, I want to live a blameless life. But how I need your help, Lord. Especially in my own home, where I long to act as I should. And so today as we talk about this, I want you to know the hardest place to show mercy is to the people that are closest to you. It's easy to show mercy to the person that's far away. It's easy to show mercy to somebody maybe that you don't have to deal with all the time. But when someone is in your face. Thanksgiving is coming. You're going to have that one relative. You already thought of them. And as I say it, you're thinking, no, no, Eric. No, no, don't touch. Don't. No, Eric. And this is where you have this conversation at home, right? You didn't invite them, did you? Yeah. Yeah, we invited them. Well, they're, you know they're not really related to us. Well, no, I invited them. No, no. You remember what they did last year? And before they even get to the house, you have already begun to hate their guts. And you've already begun to think... I'm going to attack them. And you've begun already to ramp up against them. Because the truth is, giving mercy to others starts in the mind. And if you're not careful, you will already begin to think, I'm going to get them. You, you'll begin to look and you'll, you'll begin to think of things that they're going to do wrong. And so that when they begin to do it wrong, you'll instantly notice. You'll instantly go after them. There's a story of a Christian speaker. They, she talked about um, her daughter had gone grocery shopping for her. She had a very busy day. She was exhausted. And by the way, a lot of this happens when you're exhausted. She was exhausted. And, um, and her daughter called her on her cell phone because and, and, it was raining. It started raining. She said, Mom, can you move your car out of the garage so I can pull in to unload the groceries? Well, the mom had had it. She hung up the phone. She just said, forget it. Hung up the phone. Furious. Well, the phone rang again. She picked it up and she said, listen, don't you call here. I've had a hard day. You can carry those groceries through the rain. And she just went off on her daughter. And then suddenly she realized there was another voice that said, hello. It was her pastor calling the house to check on her. Now, someone in this congregation one time accidentally sent me a text. It contained letters that I will not have to explain to you that were four letters long. I figured they had autocorrect on. I was trying to be nice and gracious, so I said, I'm sorry, you have, you're have autocorrected wrong. I don't know what you were trying to send me. Maybe good luck. He quickly responded by saying, no, I actually was mad at my friend and accidentally texted you. Here's your sign. <laughs> How would you act if I was at your house? Hopefully no better. Huh? <laughs> How would you act if you knew that what you said mattered? Now, let me give you a quiz before I uh, get to the message and see how you're doing at home, okay? This is a quiz on how merciful I am with my family. Some of you are going to get 100. 
because you're liars. <laughs> Here we go. Number, number. I should have not taken Sudafed this morning. This could be a dangerous time in the life. All right, here we go. Number one, when someone in your family or your spouse or your brother or your sister, and you can think of Thanksgiving too, okay? It's coming. When they get some details wrong while telling a story, do you A, interrupt them and correct them publicly, or B, say nothing and let it go knowing that you've done the same thing? <laughs> Number two, when someone in your family or, or some, you know, a brother or a sister or family member keeps making the same mistake you like that? over and over, I become A, irritated and angry at them, or B, I graciously forgive them and pray for them. <laughs> Number next. When a family member is getting attention for something they've done, maybe they got a raise, maybe they got a promotion, maybe they were successful in something, and you didn't. You didn't get praise for the last thing you did. You feel resentful and want to bring them down a notch even, maybe. Or at least you feel resentful, like why are they getting recognized? Or you celebrate with them. Anybody got a hundred so far? You're doing great. How many got 100 in the bad category? You're really okay. Just, I'm, sorry. I see that hand. All right. Finally, don't worry. This is it. When someone says or done something, does something in your family that you don't understand, you assume that they have the best motivation or B, you think they have the worst motivation. I'll be, <clears throat> excuse me. I'll be honest about this last one. The reason so often that I struggle with people's motivation is out of fear. Because we don't like to be rejected. We don't like for anybody to do something against us. So we instantly, to put up a guard, we instantly assume they said that on purpose. Or they did that on purpose. I know that they meant to do that. When truthfully, they may not have. And if we, more often than not, would go out of our way to assume the best, just that one thing alone would make all the difference. And so here's kind of the foundational question for you and me. Are you more polite with strangers and people at work? Or are you more polite with your family? Feel guilty enough? Ready to go home? So let me ask you two questions today. And this is kind of the theme today, okay? Here's the first one. By the way, it was really quiet last night when I did this sermon too. What if your children, your spouse, your family member... By the way, I was in Walmart one night and I heard a son talking to his elderly mother. And I wanted to kill him. I did not assume the best. The way he was talking to her, I wanted to help him to get to heaven. <laughs> right then. <laughs> I really shouldn't have seen it then. All right, so what if your family members believe what you say about them? You never fill in the blank. You always fill in the blank. You can never, you're always doing, you're always being, you're all, by the way, most of the time when you make never and always statements, they're not good. There's nothing you can do about a never statement. By the way, when Satan attacks you, he attacks you with generalities. He'll come to you and say, you're a horrible father. You're a terrible mother. You never get anything right. You can't do anything about that. The difference between conviction and condemnation is very simple. Conviction is very specific. You need to go make this right. So you go to your child and instead of saying, you've never cleaned up your room right, you know what you say? Can you go pick up your socks? You can even add to that, I've had enough of you leaving your socks there. But we go beyond that and we do character assassination and we don't fight fair and we say things to people in our family that we would never say to a stranger. So what if your kids believed or your spouse believed what you said about them? And then number two, here's the big one. 
What if you could convince your children and your family members, maybe even yourself, to believe what God says about you? To believe that no matter what you do, no matter how bad you fail, no matter how far you run, no matter how messed up and broken and ashamed you feel, that he absolutely loves and adores you. When you make a mistake and you fall down and you feel like you're in the ditch, he doesn't just come and give you a lecture about how you should get out of the ditch. He goes and picks you up and says, let me walk with you. What if we began to live that out in our families? What if we began to show our children how Jesus would treat them if he was in our home? And some of you are like, yeah, he got a whip to the temple. I remember that. I don't have time to go into that whole story, but someday. Mercy is love in action. Mercy is love in action. 1 Corinthians 13 is a passage that you hear at weddings all the time. When I meet with couples, they come to me and they go, Listen, I know you're doing our wedding. We're so excited to get married. We just love each other. He never says a mean thing to me. I just love him. I just love her. I think she's so great. She tells me the truth about myself. <laughs> Usually at that point I go, you like that? And then she says, I love it. He is so funny. Really? You like funny? How about sarcasm? You like sarcasm, right? And they go, I don't know what you're talking about. So we read this passage in a wedding. But listen, how about if you applied this to your whole family? Listen to what it says. Love is Patient. Listen, we could stop right there. You put that on your fridge and you could go home today and you wouldn't need the rest of church. You know what patience means? I've debated about saying this during a wedding, but I think it's horrible. <laughs> patience literally, you ready for this, is to suffer a long time. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great for a wedding? I might do that one of these weddings. I got, I'm up to about 500 weddings now, so I'm getting to the point that I'm getting like more irritable in weddings, like, I'm going to really tell you guys what it's like. <laughs> See that couple out there? They got in a fight on the way here. Yeah. It means to suffer long, you know. <laughs> so, so when I do the vows, I can say, will you be willing to suffer forever? <laughs> but we can't even handle it if somebody's running late. Did you know you don't have to mistreat somebody even if you don't like what they're doing? Did you know when your kids aren't doing what they want you to? Did you know that it does not help for you to scream and yell and try to control them? You're actually teaching them wrong ways to function. And most of you grew up that way, so you're just repeating the habits that you had. But you can start new habits, and it starts with patience. And patience says, even when I correct you, I'm going to correct you the right way, and I'm not going to get so mad because I think I'm going to rush this process. Love is kind. I love this word kind because it literally in the Greek is the idea of useful. It's, it's helping somebody like they need it. How do they need help? Now, some of you are enabling your children. You know, you go and clean up their room every time. That's enabling. That's not, that's not being kind. Being kind, though, is sometimes saying to your kids, okay, I know you didn't finish everything, but I'm going to go ahead and let you go to the ball game. But when you get home, you're going to finish it. That's being kind. It's giving them some kindness, something useful. Maybe it's bringing chicken soup when somebody's sick. Gentlemen, you can do that, by the way. Some of the guys are like, I don't know how to cook. Let me, let me, I'm going to show you right now how you can bring chicken soup. Ready? Two minutes. Fast forward. All right, done that. Anybody? Am I the only one who's an idiot? Who hasn't realized that the bowl gets hot in two minutes? Okay. So you get the, You put it on a plate. And you say, be careful, this is hot. Here you go. I hope you feel better. Kind. It does not envy. The word envy is to boil. It's the idea of, I can't believe they got that. And you boil. It's the idea of boiling water. It does not boast. Do I need to explain that one? It's not proud. The word proud literally means to puff up. Dad, you should have seen my basketball shot today. 
Got to hear that this week. That was my son. <laughs> it does not dishonor others. By the way, my son made the freshman team at Titusville High School. Just want to point that out. Man. Which means his dad takes him to practice at 5.50 every morning. It does not dishonor others. It is not, listen, self-seeking. Somebody asked me a question about gossip this week. They said, you know, sometimes I just need to vent to other people. They said, how do I know when I'm just like talking to a friend trying to find out if I'm crazy or if I am really gossiping? You know, what's the difference? Real easy. What's your purpose? Are you trying to make yourself look good? Are you trying to just make yourself look better? Or are you trying to figure out a way to help someone? Are you just trying to make push somebody else down so you can push yourself up? By the way, sometimes when you say things, you know you're going to get points. You'll talk about that person that used to be around or that situation that happened that they were on your side. And you know that if you say that again, they're going to go, yeah, go team. Or are you doing it selfishly just to build yourself up? It does, it's not easily angered. <laughs> Keeps no records of wrongs. We'll get to that one in a minute. Love does not delight in evil, rejoices with the truth, and always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So we're just going to focus on a few of these this morning and talk about just a few of them. Here we go. Four ways to show mercy at home. And if you have bad habits, if you have blown this and messed up, here's what I want to challenge you to do. Begin asking God one habit at a time to help you. God, just, just help me, Lord. I've responded in anger. I respond by yelling. Listen, maybe, maybe you respond by hitting things or breaking things. Hey, hey. Lord, help me. Through your spirit. Some of you may need counseling. Listen, if you're, if you're hitting or throwing or using physical things, you need help. So don't wait. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. They actually did a study. They took a group of people, 100 people, 50 in one group, 50 in the other. And they had them take this test. Simple test. Had them take the test. Group A, when they finished the test... They went over it with a fine-tooth comb, and even though people did pretty good, they acted like they all blew it, like they all messed up. The person who came in talked about how bad their class had done, how bad they had done on their test, etc., etc. The other person, by the way, the results were the same. <laughs> the other group, group B, they went in and talked about how great they did, how smart they were, and, and how they had worked so hard, and all those things. And then they gave them both a second test. Guess which group did better on test number two? Group B. Group A was nervous, felt like they would fail, and, and, and ended up actually doing worse on the test, while group B did better. So often in life, we're so busy trying to micromanage our children, or our spouse, or a coworker, or somebody else, and we think we're going to fix them when in reality, what we're doing, and I'm not talking about correction, I'm not talking about boundaries, but if we're constantly just harping on every little thing and people feel like they can never win, they will give up. Some of you grew up in homes like that, where if you jumped a foot, your parents said, oh, it would have been nicer if you jumped two. If you got an A, they would say, yeah, it's a good A, but you know, I saw some of your test scores. If you ran a race and you got first place, they would say, yeah, but your form was wrong. It didn't matter what you did. There was always something more. I want you to know something. God does not do that to you. And if you'll learn to receive God's love, that it's not easily angered and that he's not keeping a record, it'll take the pressure off. Proverbs 17, 9 says, Love forgets mistakes. Nagging about them separates even close friends. If you harp on somebody's issue, you know what you will see every time? You'll see their issue. In Proverbs 19.11, it says, To your glory, you overlook an offense. <clears throat> now, here's what I know is happening. Some of you here are not yellers. Not, not the color, but you don't scream at people, okay? Old yeller. Some of you don't yell at people, so you're sitting here and you're becoming smug as I'm talking. You're like, that's my spouse. <laughs> 
There's two kinds of people in the world that deal with issues. There are turtles and there are skunks. Turtles, when something happens, they internalize everything. So their way of dealing with it, instead of exploding on you, they withhold love. They withhold affection. They withhold conversation. That is just as wrong. The skunks explode on everyone. By the way, typically skunks and turtles marry each other. Isn't that exciting? You can point at your spouse and say, skunk, if you want. <clears throat> Every once in a while, two skunks marry each other. We call that an Italian family. <laughs> Everybody's yelling, right? But just because you're used to it or just because everybody thinks it's okay does not mean that's the best way to handle things. You don't have to explode and you don't have to stuff it. There's proper ways to deal with things. And I love this. Be careful that when you get on each other's nerves. By the way, it doesn't say when you might get on it. Did you know if you hang around anybody long enough, you will get on their nerves? Can, can I just tell you a big secret? I bother people. I know that's a shocker. But people who've been to camp with me and other places with me are like, yeah, there's a point. There's a point. We just walk away, right? Everybody, if you hang around anybody long enough, at some point you're going to find something that's going to be really easy to notice all the time. It says, when you get on each other's nerves, don't snap at each other. Look for the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. Number two, being kind when they don't deserve it. Are you only kind to people who are kind to you? Do you yell back at people when they yell at you? By the way, one of the best things you can do when somebody's in your face is to bring it down a notch. It's very hard to do. It's very hard to do. Love is patient. Love is kind. And in this other version, it says love is always supportive. In Proverbs 3, 27, it says, Whenever you're able, do good to people who need help. This means that every moment for you is an opportunity. So even now as we sit here in church, did you know you could reach out to that person you yelled at this morning? Just pat them on the arm. Or... If they go like this, you're, you're in trouble. You're... Might be flower time. Don't be hateful to people just because they're hateful to you. Rather, as Bill and Ted said, be excellent to one another. And to everyone else. Some of you laughed at that and others said he's Bill and Ted. It's all good. Number three. This is one of the hardest ones. By letting go of past hurts. The reason some of you struggle with everyone is not because of them. If you find that you struggle getting along with everyone, guess what? It's not them. Some of you just went, what? When you carry things from a past relationship or unforgiveness, which we talked about a few weeks ago, if you carry those things into a new relationship, what you will do is eventually you will begin to respond to what happened before and you will carry it into that relationship. And I know it may be the other person. Maybe you were sprayed by a skunk and you still smell skunk everywhere you go. It's time to take a tomato sauce bath, right? Time to ask for forgiveness. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love keeps no record of wrongs. You know when I discovered that this was the most helpful is when I taught school? Because I had a kid that would come in and sit right about where Brian's sitting this morning. He was a junior in high school and he was a jerk. That's in the Greek. Um, and he just was one of these kids. And he would come in and he would do stuff. And it got to be where as soon as he came in, I was laser, so he couldn't move. And my professor at that time said to me, Hey, Eric, try something. Go and sit in their chair and pray for them. You know what happened? That kid totally changed. <laughs> no, the kid was absolutely the same. You know what happened? I changed. And instead of just focusing on what they did wrong, I started saying, God, you help me to support them and encourage them. And that kid actually turned around during that school year. If I had continually just harped and child, kid, that kid's driving. <laughs> you may be that way with a spouse or one of your children. Maybe that relative is coming over Thanksgiving. You're right. I know. 
Okay, love is not rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable or touchy. Some of you are going to take that home and post it on the fridge if your spouse is up here, right? It does not hold grudges. And then finally, number four. Oh, I hope you'll get this. By believing that God is working in others' lives. This is the way you communicate to others what God is doing or what God is going to do. My mom did this. When I would come home with a D, that never happened. I'm sure it never, don't, yeah, I'm lying about the D. When I would come home with a D or worse, my mom would say, I know if you applied yourself, you could do better. Now, that didn't mean there wasn't punishment. It doesn't mean there wasn't consequences. But she would always say, this is what you can do. This is what you can be. And when I got my doctorate, my mom was there sitting in the audience cheering me on. And I was saying, you know what? If she hadn't told me what I could do, I would not be here today. ADD people do not get their doctorate degree. Amen. So how do you see your family members? Do you see what God's doing or do you see what they're doing wrong? When you look at other people, do you see what God's doing or do you see what they're doing wrong? What God can do, what God can do, that doesn't mean you justify their behavior. It doesn't mean you overlook everything that they do and you never have consequences. By the way, if they're not somebody that you do that, then you have to. It's not your job to fix them. Love always trusts, is always hopeful, always perseveres through whatever comes. You know what they've discovered about the young generation today? Some call millennials or younger. Younger. They've been given everything. They've been given toys and phones and communication. They have tons of information, but they don't have meaning. They're looking for meaning in life. And the only way they're going to discover what the meaning of life is, is to look at you. They're watching your example. Is the meaning of life how many likes you get on Facebook? Is it about yelling at the TV when somebody that comes on that you don't like? Is it about driving in traffic with me? Do you have the optional blinker package? I was in Orlando yesterday. Really? Really, do you have to be that close? Really? Oh, I want a break. Oh, I want a break. Thank you, Jesus, for the car behind me. Hope he has an airbag. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But we mess this up, and so we need this prayer. Psalms 28, 2. Lord, hear my prayer for mercy when I call to you for help, when I lift my hands towards your most holy place. Now, let me tell you what happens in a message like this. As I'm talking, you have some regrets. I understand. None of us, the Bible, uh, uh, James says, we all struggle in many ways. Isn't that good news? By the way, that's why this is the perfect church for imperfect people. So if you're perfect, don't come here. You'll mess up the curve. All right? We know that we're imperfect, but God has given us his righteousness. It's an awesome thing. But I know that you have regrets. Because we don't always say the right thing. Sometimes we act like idiots. Sometimes we would be ashamed if we videotaped and put it on the screen this morning. We'd say, oh, please don't show that. But here's the good news. You and I have an opportunity to change, to develop new habits, one at a time. As the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart, we say, Holy Spirit, make me sensitive to my family. Make me loving. Make me caring. Help me to respond in ways that I never learned from my parents. I, I didn't learn from my father how to deal with anger. I just learned how to yell at people. I never learned what you're supposed to do with that. Holy Spirit, can you teach me? In Lamentations 3... It says, I'll never forget this awful time. Some of you were saying that about the sermon this morning. Eric, I'll never forget this awful time. As I grieve over my loss, listen, yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The unfailing love of the Lord never ends. His mercies we have kept from complete destruction by his mercies. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each day. It's a new day. So starting today, say, God, would you help me? 
Father, would you help me to respond to people in love? Lord, would you help me? By the way, people say, don't pray for patience. Do you think God in heaven goes, oh, you didn't pray for it, so I'm not giving it to you. <laughs> I, I laugh at people say, I don't want to pray for patience. Let me tell you something. God's not in heaven going, no, well, I guess I'm not going to teach you that one. You didn't ask. Trust me. He teaches you patience through life when things don't go well. So let me ask you this again. What have you said to your kids, to your spouse, that if they believe, it would not be good? Today, start to tell them what God thinks about them. Today, begin to tell them that even when they make a mistake, God has given you mercy and grace and forgiveness. And sometimes you might even have to say, you know, I'm really sorry. I hope you can forgive me for my mistakes, for my failures. And in the middle of that, when you begin to love and care for each other and show each other the way to God, other people begin to say, what's different about your family? What's different about your marriage? What's different about your children? Because these are the same ways that God shows you mercy. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you have not received his mercy. He gave you the free gift of salvation, John 3, 16. He loved you so much before you did anything, the Bible says, he sent his son. So if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to encourage you today. Come up after the service and say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. I've heard about him, I know about him, but I've never surrendered to him. I want to surrender my life to him today. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian, and the truth is, as I talk today, you just, hey, it's a new day. Ask God to fill you with his spirit, to fill you with his grace, and he'll do it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, even as I present this message, I'm very aware of my failures. Lord, I'm very aware so often I get focused on the wrong things. And Lord, many of us do. And so, Father, we pray that you would give us new and fresh, a touch of your spirit to know your presence and to walk in it, to know how to show love and mercy to our families. Father, I pray that for that one, especially here today, who's never given their life to you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. Lord, bless each part of the service. Bless our offering as we take our offering today that you use to do wonderful things around the world. We pray, Father, that you would speak to hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Light of the world, you step down into darkness, open my eyes.